Um, oh yeah, right, okay, so let me just uh, get up my morning liturgy. And if you want to follow along with the, with the autumn liturgy we're using for our morning prayer, it's pinned to the top of our Facebook page. Um, so you should be able to find that on the Facebook page. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I think I'm going to get started then. <clears throat> the night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. So I'm going to light my candle now. And if you've got a candle at home, you are invited to light yours along with me. Okay, that was a near miss. <laughs> having a bit of, having a bit of uh, match drama here. I've always wondered whether this would happen, whether I would try and light it and something would go wrong. Okay, here we are. This is why people use those nice lighters, those electric lighters, or whatever they are. Anyway, right, all safe, candle lit. Pop this here. Just pop it down so we can see it for a second. And I'll say our prayer. We light this candle as a symbol of our faith and hope for our future as a parish, a people, a world. We trust in the alchemy of the Holy Spirit to bring her dream to life here amongst us. Gather your people, O God, that your dream may for us, uh, may you, that your dream for us may come true. Amen. And today's collect. Almighty God, who built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone, so join us together in the unity of the Spirit by their doctrine, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> One God, now and forever. Amen. So we come to our Bible readings now, and I'm going to start with Psalm 67. Uh, I'm reading it from the uh, New Revised Standard Version. So that's Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face shine upon us, that your way may be known upon the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let all the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. Let the, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity, and guide the nations upon earth. Let all the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere him. Okay, so let's move on then to our Mark passage. So it's Mark chapter 6, 1 to 13. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? 
What is this wisdom that he's been that's been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hand? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honour except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except, um, except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put them on and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake the dust that is on your, your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. So, um, as usual, I'm just going to maybe point out a couple of things that have struck me about that the passage, and uh, and we'll um, well you you're welcome to start you know making your comments or thoughts about the passage as well. Um, and then I'll read it through again, and you can and you can see what you think. So um, I think one thing that I would, I would say about um, this passage is it's very similar actually to other passages um, with, where Jesus is sending his disciples out. Um, one in, that we had quite recently, if you were with us for our um, St Luke's Day service at well, we were at the bombed out church, and Miranda was preaching um, on the the Luke passage. Um, where Jesus is sending out, I think in that case it's sending out the seventy. Let me just double check. But um, it's got it's got very similar um, a similar tone. This idea of sort of being sent out on mission to um, to uh, go go out in pairs to bring nothing with you. And um, and one thing that really sort of well that Miranda mentioned in her talk, but that really struck me again here is this um, idea of how how we're challenged to go out with nothing. We always think we need to be more equipped or better prepared when we are maybe sharing a message um, about Jesus or just about our own faith or uh, whatever it is. But I, but actually, I think there's a, a kind of a, an element here where Jesus is really trying to encourage people to sort of go, um, not worry about about whether we're equipped or not, um, and to really sort of just be bold, really. Um, yeah, and I'm uh, just reading my notes. Yeah, that that's also that, that it is sort of part of everyone's calling for those who, who believe and trust in Jesus, that we share, we share good news with others. Um, and it doesn't need to be done by the vicar or by the mission, mission partner or whatever it is. Um, it's just a natural part of what it means to be a Christian, I think. Um, so um, another part that really sort of stood out to me is this prophets are not without honour except in their own home. And uh, whenever I read that, I always um, think about how after having left home to go to well, art college in London, and I'm from the southwest, so it was a big move. I sort of found myself there and um, remember coming back home and feeling like my, you know, my parents wanted my, my siblings kind of put me back in the box that I'd been in um, in my youth and, and sort of find, like feeling as though, why doesn't anyone listen to me? I, I've got my own ideas about life now and I don't have to be the way you've, you've told me I am. Uh, I don't know whether anyone can relate to that, but um, that, that's what, that always strikes me about this idea that you, that there's something, there's something about um, those who you've grown up with there's, it's almost it can be a barrier to really to really seeing the potential of someone at times not always but in, I think this is maybe a little bit about what this is about 
but yeah, some thoughts on that would be great as well if you want to um, write your comments. Um, and then the other the other aspect I think that struck me was um, where where in verse six it says Jesus was amazed at their unbelief, and um, and I just wondered whether there's something here about healing healing ministry we're learning more about the way Jesus healing ministry works and I think yesterday morning Louis was talking about this as well um in the instant, in that instance where the um the, the woman who was bleeding she Jesus feels some of his power goes out go out of him and um and I think in this in this story we're seeing that perhaps there's something about healing uh, Jesus is healing in this instance where it's it's a sort of participatory thing. People's faith um, or lack of faith affects the ability for them to be healed by Jesus. And and it's sort of, I wonder if there's something about Jesus working with us when when healing is required. It's a, it's a sort of two-way thing or something. Um, but of course, I can think of examples where people have um, had sort of amazing, miraculous stories where they weren't seeking jesus at all so i don't know great to know what you think um and then the last thought was just on uh jesus calling calling them uh to to go out in twos and i think again this is something that Miranda picked up on when she was talking about the the luke passage but it it's um there's something really reassuring about this idea of not having to go out and do all these things on your own that actually we're you know we're supposed to have companions along the way um so i'm gonna i'm gonna read it again and um keep the comments coming and then i'll start to read through some of those and and we can have a chat so he left that place and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him on the sabbath he get, began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded they said where did this man get all this what is this wisdom that he's been given that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Je and Simon? And are not the, these his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Then Jesus said to them, "Prophets are not without honour, except in their hometown, and among their own kin." and in their own house. And he, and he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages, teaching. He called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts but to wear sandals and to put on two tunics. That's right, and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Okay. So let's have a little read through. So Janet's saying, going unequipped keeps them dependent on God and allows the people um, they go to to give them something back, give back. To sorry give something back to them yeah i like i really like that because i think that's that's it and people i think you know something i think i was talking about a bit on sunday but people don't like i don't like someone doing stuff to me i'd rather um a relationship was two ways and and actually there's a dependence on being being a guest and then there's there's something nice about being hospitable to a guest and there's that i think there's yeah there's something in that um, Sazine is saying for the disciples to be accepted as they are in simple attire with nothing but faith to offer. Yeah. Is that, so that's a question, Sazine, for the disciples? Is this in response 
to this idea of going out with nothing. Mm. Yeah, nothing but faith. I think that's it. It's very, um, it's it's quite risky, isn't it? It's, 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 they must have had to fit, been quite brave to do that, I think. And then Sue's saying, I can relate to that. People who see you growing up sort of get stuck on who you were mm, rather than who you've become while they were not looking. Yes, that's it. While they were not looking. I like that. Hmm. Janet's saying, if they don't believe in Jesus and are busy dissing him, they won't let him near enough to heal them. They won't let themselves be vulnerable. Yeah, I think this is it. And I see Catherine, um, Kath, sorry, is saying, I don't like the idea of not of healing not working um, if you don't have enough faith. And uh, yes, yeah, some people obviously are praying desperately and have lots of faith. And that, yeah, and how disappointing when those prayers aren't answered. I do think this is, in lots of ways, one of the most difficult things about anything miraculous, actually, you know, any healing or anything like that. It's, it's, it's the big question of like, why this person and not that person? And that's extremely difficult and painful. Um, so I see what you're saying, I, but, it, but as I was kind of briefly mentioning, I think there is, a, you know, I could think of examples of people who um, had no faith and, and, and maybe prayed at just once and something incredible happened and changed their lives. And it seems to us, I think it seems baffling and uh, at best and then pretty disappointing um, at worst. But, um, but I, but I think to sort of in this in this passage i think there is something kind of that janet's picking up on as well that, that there's something about working in partnership and and accepting jesus as as who he's saying he is um and and allowing themselves to be vulnerable rather than um proud or whatever it is that they are to him in his hometown so i guess in this instance i think we take it in the context of of where Jesus is, is taught and where he is and where, where he's talking, the people he's talking about. Um, right, so I'll just move on. The, the root problem is trust, says Karen. They question Jesus because he is just the carpenter, son of Mary. Yes, this is it. So um, he's just like a local boy, isn't he? <laughs> where's, this, where's, the, where's this wisdom come from that he's been given? That's it. And so Vivian saying, understand, but have issues about respecting beliefs of others, especially other religions, even wacky ones. And many in speaking about Jesus don't seem to have this. Is that, I'm just wondering, Vivian, you're sort of talking about an arrogance of coming into people's lives and sort of proclaiming truth, that sort of thing. And in which case, I, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, um, I, I mean, I, I think now, and in our context, maybe we do things differently. And actually, I think I think the in lot there were there were other instances. I mean, here Jesus is is calling his you know Jewish disciples to come and talk to Jewish people about about Jewish stuff. It's not this is not the mission to the Gentiles yet. And I think there's there are yes we need to think carefully and sensitively about what we're doing and who we who we're talking to and. Um, yeah, so I think there's a lot more in that, but, um, yeah, I think we need to absolutely have respect for other people at our core. And Sue's just talking about shaking off the dust. Love this when you face rejection. Shake it off. Yeah, <laughs> just said that and I just suddenly, um, Taylor Swift came to mind. That was that shake it off song, wasn't it? Okay, uh, Janice again. I think the not having enough faith doesn't mean faith to be healed specifically, which is what many healers claim today. Mm. I think it means not letting Jesus close to them, keeping him, keeping him at arm's length. Yeah, thanks for that. There are, um, yes, a lot of very unhelpful people out there saying, you know, it's your lack of faith, which I, I don't agree with. So, yeah, I'm glad you've said that. Um, Rosalind is replying to Karen. Jesus does heal a few people in Nazareth. Nazareth, yeah. Perhaps they were those who were prepared to be vulnerable. Mm. And so when I have faith, I approach everything differently. Somehow it becomes easy to do anything. Mm. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I think something that um, I was chatting with someone about yesterday, I'm um, praying for confidence, but not necessarily my own confidence, but 
confidence in what God can do through me, through us, through anyone. And um, and that can be really empowering, actually, I think. Um, and then Janet says, Jesus never healed everyone. Mm. And St. Paul wasn't healed of his eye trouble. That's absolutely, yeah, the thorn in his side, despite repeatedly praying he would. Um, or is that the eye trouble when he was dazzled by the light? Anyway, yes, good point. And then Sally's saying, uh, you're right, Kath, it is very dangerous teaching um, prayer. Yeah, dangerous teaching RE prayer that damages a lot of people. Mm. Yeah, so we do absolutely need to be careful about how we approach a passage like this and start applying it to things immediately. Um, so, yeah, but thank you for all your comments. And, uh, yeah. I'm going to, I think I'm going to leave it there and we'll, we'll move on to the rest of our prayer time. <clears throat> Just um, noticed that my, my battery is running out, so one second while I just plug, plug in the charger. Okay. Let's move into a, a time of prayer and take these conversations and anything that it's brought up into, into these, this prayer time. Mm. And, uh, and yeah, please do write your prayers in the comments box. So let's pray. God, we thank you for this time where we can bring all our, uh, all our thoughts, everything that's on our hearts before you now. And so we have a moment now where we bring before you uh, issues that are troubling us, that are concerning us about our world. And think of places where there is conflict And continue to pray for Nigeria and for Syria. We pray for places where human pride uh, has taken over and we ask God that um, leaders of those countries and those places might have wisdom. Pray for places where, um, where, where people are struggling to know how to deal with the, the virus. And we think as well about our own government as it comes together to try and make plans for um, a coordinated response to, to the virus for Christmas time. And we pray that our leaders might be able to find... Uh, wise ways to move forward. We pray for those who are suffering with, with the virus at the moment across the world and we pray for hospitals coping with the volumes of patients. We pray for the USA um, in this time of uh, preparing for the elections. And God, we pray that you are guiding candidates to uh, have the, uh, the interests of their people and I guess an awareness of their influence uh, on the wider world at the heart of their policies and their, and their campaigns. And God, we pray for those seeking asylum across the world, but in particular those who are travelling across the channel in dangerous seas. 
when we think especially of the, the women and children who died yesterday. And we just hold a moment to remember them. We pray, Lord, that we might be a nation who is compassionate. We pray for all those who are desperately seeking better lives. We pray that we might have a generosity of spirit, not only to appreciate what we have and how lucky we are, but to um, to be able to give generously. And we pray for the church across the world too, um, that it might be able to respond in creative ways to the difficulties it's facing with the virus. We pray for our own church here We ask for God's guidance as we uh, make plans for, for Christmas and the coming months. We pray for those who are feeling isolated, who haven't been able to connect, or maybe who have but are still feeling far away from everything. And we pray for God's comfort and peace. We pray for those who we know close to us who are suffering at this time, whether that's in body, uh, in body, spirit or mind. And we pray for those uh, who we know of, who are grieving at this time. We continue to pray for Beth and her family, for Josh and Penny in hospital, and for Zoe's family. So we'll bring our prayers together with uh, the Lord's Prayer and I'm using our version that we, we've got at the moment uh, from the New Zealand Prayer Book. <clears throat> Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in whom is Heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In the times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. 
for you, for you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. And then our closing responses. At the turn of the year and the turn of the leaf, we look back at those things that have flourished for a season, but now are falling to the ground. For all that has been, thanks. At the turn of the year and the turn of the leaf, we rejoice in nature's bounty and abundance, even as we are aware of waste, inequality and injustice. For all that is, peace. At the turn of the year and the turn of the leaf, we draw closer together for warmth and company as we look ahead for a season of cold and dormancy. For all that will be, strength. And so the blessing of God, the womb of creation, the word of life and the wind of change be with you and rest upon your homes now and always. Amen. And our closing prayer. In the circle of God's love, we are one. The circle is never broken. In the light of God's welcome, we are one. The light never goes out. Let children teach us the wisdom of play. Let neighbours teach us the gentleness of care. May the circle surround us when we are apart. And may the light draw us together again. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining me this morning. And uh, thanks again for all the comments and the prayers. That's been great to be here with you. And uh, I'll see you again soon. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.